Okay, today I want to tell what I think is kind of a simple but interesting story, and that's really where materials come from. I'm going to tell it in the context of one very specific material in one specific place, but that whole thing can be generalized and hopefully used in your, in your curricula and in your teaching. So where do materials come from is the idea. The big idea is materials are central to our modern existence and the whole idea of material wealth. And I think if you're going to be an educated human and vote and do all those things, you, you really should understand where these things come from that we use, what the environmental burden might be, how that all works, and a lot of good things you can get from uh, videos and, and, and series like how it's made and so forth. But I want to give a very concrete example. It's maybe a little bit different that uh, shows how this really can me mesh into the whole curriculum of, a, of an educated high school student. And I'm going to focus on a specific, uh, what's going on a specific place, that is Butte, Montana. So here are our learning objectives. I want to understand how materials really fit into a broad and liberal education at the high school level. And then hopefully I'm giving you something that you can use to inspire some of your students to go off and do hands-on labs and look at materials extraction, look at the way we use materials, look at reduction, reuse, recycling, all of that. This is a great platform for all of that. And again, it all really boils down to having some technical skills to be able to evaluate and then eventually come up with new solutions. And that's what we need your students to do is really come up with new solutions some days on how we, how we deal with these problems that we haven't done so well with in the past. And that's really what I want to show is how we haven't really done so well with some of these things in the past. So um, big point here is material science, which we're promoting teaching, is an integrator. And it really works through the disciplines of science, technology, math, and engineering, the standard STEM disciplines. And some people put STEAM in there, with, with, uh, put arts in there, and it also works in there. Some people put medicine in there also, make it an S-T-E-M-M -M or S-T-A-M-M -M with medicine. And materials is also important there. Uh, plenty of good examples of new materials going into people's bodies. Uh, I've had that happen myself a couple of times now. It's a different story, though. And uh, what I want to do is show how materials fits into history, sustainability, and public policy, uh, eventually product design, not this lecture, you know, art, hands-on skills, all these things are important. This is why material science belongs in high school. Okay, let's set this up with an historical example. The electric light was invented in 1871. That story is well known. Telephone was invented in 1876, also a well-known story. Uh, a couple of great American inventors at the, the end of the 19th century did things, uh, Ed Edison and um, Alexander Graham Bell. So what material was brought into huge demand as a result of these great, great uh, inventions that, that transformed our lives and really ushered in the modern age in many ways? Give yourself a couple of seconds to think. Okay, time's up. What do we need to do those things? Well, copper. Copper is a thing because we need to transmit electrons long distances from where it's either produced in a generator out to where it's used or to transmit signals down a copper phone wire. That's the way it was done then. Um, today we use uh, fiber optic cables to, to transmit data long distances or sometimes bounce things off satellites or Wi-Fis and things like that. But back in those days, all we had was copper. And then, um, so it's highly conductive. That, that's still what we use today to transmit electricity. And it's also modest cost, and I do have these around uh, the, the quotes around cost for a reason, because uh, we really have to understand what 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 happens when we when we make copper. So again, uh, back around the end of the 19th century, 1870s, these things came in. What happens? Well, it was found out that uh, probably the richest copper deposits still in North America were in Butte, Montana. Uh, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan is another place that they found remarkably rich uh, uh, iron and copper deposits. And uh, this is what Butte looked like back in the late, uh, eight, uh, late 1800s, early 1900s. So back here in about 1873, uh, Butte had a population of about 3,000 people. We get uh, a few years later, just uh, seven years later, we go to about 23,000 people. And a few years after that, we're up around 100,000 people. And today, Butte's back down around uh, 3,300 people that are, that are there. It's a beautiful place in the Rockies, but in a lot of ways, it looks like Detroit today. You can see it's a place that had great past splendor. It's not what it was. It's dog-eared in a lot of places. It, it sustained in a long period of time a much larger population than it is now. And there's also a lot of environmental damage, and we'll go through that in, in some detail. 
So what did copper bring to Butte? Let me give a couple examples. First of all, this is Butte 1920. It looks almost like Manhattan in 1920. And bear in mind, Butte, there's nothing else around it. It's out in the middle of the Rockies and um, building up big buildings, lots of wealth. Um, big boom town happened. All kinds of stories of uh, liquor, women, all, all, all those things. Uh, shootings, uh, big, big, uh, massive boom town. And you can see right in the middle of town here also there, there's... There's these mine um, mine trellises everywhere. You can see them up on the on the uh, horizon as well. Places filled with them, even today. Kind of amazing. Other thing it brought to the, the other thing copper brought to Butte was massive carnage. Actually, big mine disasters. Uh, about 180 people went down in one particularly bad uh, bad mine disaster in 1917. And uh, there are also some big explosions. Oops. Big explosions that took place back then. People were uh, using dynamite to blast. Some of this dynamite wasn't stored properly, caused another bit of bad carnage, huge fires, all kinds of things. <laughs> all kinds of massive disasters happened in Butte back in about back in those days, in the early 1900s. Not a very safe place to be for most people, uh, and the work was obviously tough, hard underground. So, um, but at the same time. Uh, there are a few people did extremely well off of this. Uh, there's this group of people called the Copper Kings that uh, basically ran the town. They they owned the resources, put people to work, uh, made up made things like the Copper Kings mansions, um, had furniture fit for I, I don't know who maybe maybe Liberace. Um, you could make your own own guess on that, but. Uh, point is there was a few people that did very, very well on this. In some ways, this looks like uh, society today. There's also a whole lot of people that were required to make things happen. Uh, and uh, again, loads of people from all over the world actually came over. There was a big Irish contingent, Chinese contingent, uh, Germans, Americans all came to work the mines, went underground, uh, not paid very well, led big, massive mine activity, uh, labor organizers, labor organizers that were were killed mysteriously, all co all sorts of things, all sorts of unrest, turmoil, all basically in getting the copper to make our phones and electric lights work, and that's the way materials still work today. It's a central thing that's required to make everything work, and there are costs for it. The other big cost is an environmental cost. Um, this was basically done in open pit mining, and there's still open pit mining today in Butte, and there's underground mining. And there was one particularly big open pit that was put uh, put very close to Butte. You can see here's the open pit. Here's houses down here, downhill from it. Uh, this is a famous thing called the Berkeley Pit. You can look look up uh, back about 1982. This was so, sold to Arco Metals. They decided it was too expensive to run the pumps that kept the water out of it. They turned the pumps off. Ironically, on Earth Day in 1982, it started filling up. The water started leaching the metals out of the, the exposed rock. The exposed rock normally doesn't see water this way. It gave up a very acidic solution, very heavy, heavily heavy metal laden. Uh, and the water today is rising at about a foot a month. And it's expected to come at parity with the water table in about 2020. And this is a potential huge environmental disaster. I'm sure that uh, resources will be spent to fix it, but uh, it's a big, big deal, and you can look up the Berkeley pit. Again, this is one of the things that happens when you when you use materials. You've got to use them smart. We can use them smart, but got to look forward. So today, I um, got to spend a week in Butte last summer, and it's, it's an amazing place, beautiful place. But you can see any place you take, pictures are, oops, are kind of run down and so forth. Um, the Copper Kings is people that, that made lots of money. They're, they're now the, 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 the uh, mascot for the baseball team. Uh, downtown doesn't look so big, though so great. Their biggest, ex their most notable export probably is Evil Knievel. Depending on uh, how old you are, you may or may not know who Evil Knievel is. And they've got a celebration for Evil Knievel these days. And uh, these guys, Spanky Spangler, as Evil's no longer with them, is the guy that usually provides the entertainment. And whereas evil used to jump over things and land, uh, Spanky's gig is he just pretty much crashes into the side of things, and people still love it. And uh, point is, though, this was a place that created enormous wealth for a lot of people, made the eastern United States electrified, brought brought modern civilization to to bear, and much of the wealth did not stick in Butte. Um, it's a hard scrabble town. 
beautiful town, good people, all of that, but uh, the wealth from the mining didn't stick. So there's, there's a lot here that, that students can use to actually see how technical development and society are linked and people should understand this. At a very granular level, we sh should also understand um, how copper can be part of a science lesson. Okay, we talked about before, one of the things we've, we've harped on in this class is properties. Copper has great properties. We can actually measure the properties. We can put units on them, and I'll, I'll give you a slide on this in a little bit. The other thing we can do is we can make copper from rock um, and see that two things are important with this. One, when you make copper from rock, it takes a lot of energy, a little power plant symbol here, and also creates a massive amount of waste. But you can demonstrate real chemistry. It's every bit as real as the usual chemistry experiments you do when you can do it on, on a material that is absolutely central to our civilization. So the way it's done now, and these are pictures from, from last summer, um, what we end up doing when we're making copper, we take ore out of the hill, and it turns out there's about a pound of copper in a little over 200 pounds of ore. And that ore that comes out of the hill gets ground up like that, makes it into a fine sand. We've got special surfactants that goes through. It gets mixed with water and little, the little mixy things down like you see here at the bottom. And the copper-rich sand floats to the top. So this is the mining, the grinding. This is the floating on the right. And then you can take it and smelt it or electro-win it which is basically turn it into uh, a copper and see that there's, also, there's, there's a lot of waste for a little bit of copper. And then you can process it. This part of it we can actually do in our lab. And there are probably ways that uh, there are ways you can actually get these, these minerals to, to do this with if you would like to go all the way from uh, ore to copper to products in your lab at, or in your, your classroom. You can do that. So here's a lab or, a, a, a lab or classroom process. Uh, if you can find copper ore from a friendly mine, and uh, we have some friends in the copper business, um, you can take that material, you can reduce it in class. There's two ways of doing it. There's a way you can basically heat it in a, in a carbon-based environment, heat it with charcoal, that's smelting, or you can do an electrochemical process, basically dissolve the copper in some acid. You can run a current through it and have one electrode uh, is copper, will we'll plate the copper out. It's the same, same way exactly it's done uh, in industry, except on a much, much larger scale. You can make a little bead of copper out of uh, something like that. You might get a little copper. Again, 1% or 2% of the, of the mass is going to turn into copper. And then you could take that and actually, if you're clever about it, use a wire drawer and make wire out of that with a, a, uh, a, a hand drawing plate. And these are all things that are part of the ASM materials curriculum that uh, I think you're all familiar with. This is a, a copper from malachite. This is a copper-bearing ore that you could go buy at a rock store. Uh, this is first done in, uh, uh, I think, written up uh, in, in Albuquerque by the group that does uh, material science for chemistry there. So anyway, that, that can be done in the lab. Once you have the copper, you can measure properties of it. We can measure strength. If you, particularly if you make a wire, it's very easy. If you have a small diameter wire, it doesn't take a very large force on it to extend it. You know, something like a water and a milk jug will do that. This is written up and this is part of the series. If you have any trouble finding that, let me know. We can also measure the conductivity of the copper with something no more complicated than, a, than an ohm meter. So you can, it's, it's kind of a cool series. You can go all the way from, you know, this copper rich sand to measuring the properties of material. And by the way, this is the stuff that civilization is built on. So that, that, that's the way this can fit into a high school curriculum. I'm not going to go into a whole lot more depth here. But what about other materials? Um, you know, th this is this lecture is largely about where materials come from. Uh, polymers are interesting. The things your milk jugs are made of, polyethylene, polypropylene, etc., mostly come from petroli petroleum products. Now biopolymers are coming out. If you look at a careful analysis of petroleum versus biopolymers, it takes a fair bit of energy to make either one. And if you use biopolymers, you're probably diverting crops that, that might that might be used for food otherwise. So uh, is, is cost either way. Wood and paper are an interesting story. Uh, of course, wood is grown. Paper comes from wood. And again, there's still energy that goes into uh, transporting, cutting the wood. Uh, often this is, it might be kiln dried. If you make paper out of it, again, it's ground up. Use a lot of water. Um, dry it out. There's a lot of energy and process that goes into that. If you look at concrete and cement, 
You basically mine, uh, mine a mineral, you calcine it with a high temperature reaction and put a lot of energy into that. That makes it so it reacts with water to make this hard stuff that uh, we call concrete. The cement is the binder. The concrete has aggregate and the like in it to make, uh, to make the stuff that we use. Glasses and ceramics, again, it starts with mining, then there's often a refining process. And if you're making a glass, you mix these sands at high temperature and so forth. Um, the gypsum wall, you know, wallboard is made out of gypsum, another mining process goes on, and then it's processed further. Energy and waste are part of all of these processes, and they're all very interesting. And these could possibly make uh, little term papers of their own of tell us how you get this. You can do the same thing with paint and um, all, all kinds of things. Everything you use every day has a story much like that for copper. And the reason I use the copper one is it's, it's nice and it's centralized in one, one location, making it a little bit easy to understand. So if you look at global trends, um, here's, here's Australia, um, typical of anything. This is annual production, a whole bunch of different different minerals, including diamonds and lead and copper. And you can see the trend with almost all of these things is up in a big way like that. And we're using more stuff all the time. So the problems that we saw in Butte are still with us, not quite as clear and crystalline sometime, but you can see the annual production of everything is going up. Mining, fortunately, is much less human, human labor intensive. That saves a lot of lives, keeps people um, in, in, in better, better jobs by and large. But these problems still go on. The other thing that's very interesting is you look at ore grade, and, and don't worry too much about the units here. These are all either percents or things like carats per ton and so forth. But the big trend is you look at ore grade versus time, it's decreasing. And I'm sorry, I'm having a little trouble with my and today. Um, it's decreasing with time everywhere. Everything is going down. The mines are getting depleted of the really good ore. We use the good stuff first and the, the, the not so good stuff later. So there's a higher and higher fraction of, of refuse that's being developed as we end up pulling material out of the earth for stuff that we like. So that's interesting and troubling. The place that we might find an answer for that is actually landfill. So, you know, we know that for copper, it's under about half a percent of what you pull out of the ground is actually copper. But if you look in a landfill, it's about 7% metal. It's about 15 times more rich than the mines are these days. Pretty soon, the place we're going to be looking for new materials is the stuff that's already been used. We're going to, we should be following the, you know, reuse, reuse, recycle, repurpose. Oh, is it reduce, recite? You know the, the, the you, you know the R's. Uh, I should re <laughs> not going to go into them. Uh, but but this this is the idea. This is where the, uh, the 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 stuff of the future will often come from. So I'm going to try to keep it short. So summary: Our materials are central in satisfying our needs. There are societal costs in using and disposing them. We have to mine. We have energy that has to go in, usually lots of energy, and I, we'll talk about this later, about a third of the energy that we use as a country goes into actually making stuff. A big part of that is mining. Then we've got waste to dispose. So big thing is there's lots of challenges and opportunities in this, and we need your students to be engaged with this. That's the bottom line. So thanks very much, and we'll talk to you. Send me an email if you have any questions, and uh, we will be talking soon.